So we're finally doing the shunt mod and we're trying it first on a $3,000 card, the Titan V. The idea of this mod is to help reduce the power restriction that we're facing with the card. NVIDIA has shunts that are in line and those help determine how much power is being drawn. So if we can trick the card, the GPU, into thinking it is drawing lower power than it actually is, that will give us more power headroom for overclocking and for maintaining higher clocks for longer periods of time. This will help us in our endeavors to hold the top slots on Time Spy Extreme or whatever until the real overclockers get their hands on cards, and it'll be a good learning experience so we can show how you can find shunts and what the process of shorting them does. This video is brought to you by the Gamers Nexus Anti-Static Mod Mat. Our mod mat uses a high quality anti-static surface with a rubberized finish. We also have a custom paint job on it which includes reference points and cheat sheets for PCIe, EPS 12 volt and other power cables along with quick reference thermal paste application guides, a screw sorter for your video card teardowns, and it includes a common ground point and a grounding strap to help protect the products you are working on from electrostatic discharge. Pre-order your mat now at the link in the description below. So starting at the very basics, the shunt resistor exists so that NVIDIA can figure out how much power is being supplied to the GPU at any given time, which allows them to then determine at what point it's time to start power throttling the GPU. We have removed the thermal throttle scenario by modding the card to have a liquid cooler on it. There are three primary candidates for clock drops or clock monitoring or mitigation on NVIDIA. It's thermals, we've resolved that, it's voltage, and it's power. And the last two kind of go hand in hand. So to figure out how much power is going to the GPU, NVIDIA is putting an inline shunt resistor, which has a known voltage going into it, 12 volts, coming from the PCIe connectors, and it has a known resistance, in this case, five milliohms. If you look at the components, it's written right on it. So what they need to know is the current, and they can figure that out from all the other numbers that we've laid out. So then, if we short the shunts with liquid metal, we are basically tricking the GPU into thinking it's pulling less power than it is. There are components on the board, like the INA3221, which we can highlight uh, over on this side of the board. So this thing right here is the INA3221. This device is responsible for monitoring the voltage drop across the shunt resistors. This is a shunt resistor. There are several of them on the card. So what happens is when the INA3221 detects that uh, we are starting to near the power limit, it's going to send the signals required to start power throttling the clock. We're going to have uh, lower core clocks as a result, and that's what we're trying to fix. To point out the shunts that we have, we've got this one over here. The suspicion is that this links up to this 8-pin connector, and I'm going to show you how we can prove that, just to be safe. There's this one over here. This shunt also 5 milliohms, we think talks to the 6-pin by way of proximity. There's another shunt. This one we know talks to the PCIe slot. And then finally, there's a mystery shunt over here, and we're not sure what this goes to. And then we're going to short these two exclusively to try and trick the GPU to a point of thinking that it's facing uh, less resistance, maybe uh, increase our power budget a little bit by doing so. So let's start off by making sure that the shunts are the correct ones. If you're ever planning to do a shunt mod on an expensive card and you find a tutorial on the internet, whether it comes from us, Buildzoid, or someone random, you should probably double check to make sure the information is accurate. You can do this by taking a cheap digital multimeter or voltmeter, and what we're going to do is measure to determine which shunt is in the power line for which power connector. So let's just go ahead and start with a scenario that we think will, uh, will not work. So what we're looking for, we're measuring resistance, so you switch into ohms. So we're measuring resistance between the, uh, the power line, which is going to be, actually we have our, our GN mod mat over here showing its usefulness already. So this is, I'll plug it really quickly. If you go to store.gamersnexus.net slash mod mat, you can pick one of these up. We have them on pre-order now. They're anti-static as well. But it has this handy chart on it. So we have an 8-pin and a 6-pin, and what we need to do 
is measure the 12 volt lines from each against the shunt. You can measure either side of the shunt versus any of these yellow pins on our mat. If, and I can demonstrate this, if you measure this pin, the uh, extra sense pin actually right here, sense B, if you measure this sense pin, uh, it's not gonna work. It'll give you an invalid value. If you measure any of the ground pins, same thing. So we need only the yellow. And those are our 12 volt lines. The reason we need these is because this uh, 12 volt line is gonna have the shunt in line with it. So if we are measuring resistance from the shunt to the correct 12 volt line, we should see zero ohms or very close to it, zero resistance. If we're measuring incorrectly or to the incorrect line or to a ground, you'll see an increasing number over time, a non-zero number we'll call it. Okay, so we already know where we think each one goes to. I think this goes to eight, this goes to six. I'm gonna measure them to the opposite of what I think, just to make a point. So we can measure either side of the shunt resistor against, let's just choose the sense pin. So again, referencing our mat, this far right pin is a green pin, it's sense, it is not voltage. So we're gonna measure that versus the shunt resistor and we should get an increasing value over time, a non-zero value. As you can see, that number is increasing right now. If we measure it versus the ground or the black on the mod mat, you can see that is an increasing non-zero value. So then, if we measure it against a 12 volt line, we're gonna see either a zero value or non-zero. Let's measure it first against the eight pin. That should be non-zero and it is. So you can see that number is going up. So it, this is not, this shunt resistor is not in line with that power connector. Let's measure against the six pin. All three of the bottom row are 12 volt referencing our mod mat. So we can point out one of those and we're gonna get a zero value. Now it will occasionally increase a little bit because it is uh, one, a cheap meter and two, it's refreshing its measurements regularly. But whenever we kind of back off and go back on to check, we're gonna get a zero value or extremely close to it. So this, Shunt then is in line with that six pin because we're getting basically zero values every time we check. Next thing to do is check this shunt. So we've now determined that this is, goes to here, this goes to here, so we can short these two. So here's the safety disclaimer. Liquid metal contains gallium. Gallium could potentially react poorly with tin. Solder contains tin. These shunt resistors are soldered to the PCB with a tin solder. If we put a gallium liquid metal on top of it, it is possible that if we don't protect the solder, you could over time have a reaction that causes the liquid metal to eat the solder and you'll, your shunt will fall off the card. So that's your disclaimer. We are only doing this mod for benchmarking and it will be very brief. We're not leaving this for months at a time. I'm not recommending that you do it. Uh, it's at your own risk. So we should be fine, but I want to point that out. So to, pre to prevent any issues there, you can use a nail polish around the perimeter. You can use a liquid tape. You can use electrical tape. There's all kinds of options. We're gonna put a very thin layer on here and just make sure we're protecting any components that are neighboring to prevent the liquid metal from, sh from shorting those while we are also shorting the shunt. So let's just kind of paint over those. Now, part of this process is uh, building, like I said, a, a wall or a moat or a well around the resistor, particularly below it. We're gonna have this vertical and a bench. That means if liquid metal drips off, it's gonna drip down. So this, we're gonna use Thermal Grizzly Conduct a Knot. And I have actually some liquid metal that is still still on the Q-tip from originally using it like a month ago, which goes to show that this stuff doesn't actually just evaporate over a period of a month like some people say online. Uh, so we're gonna use whatever's on there and if I need more, I'll add it. And trying to be very precise here. This can be removed with rubbing alcohol pretty easily. Uh, cotton ball also is very helpful in removal. And we just need to bridge each side of the shunt to the other side. As always with liquid metal, the key is to use as little as possible, especially when we're concerned about solder joints and solder health of the tin underneath it. 
So we don't want any excess that'll drip down and cause damage. And this, you'll notice it doesn't have any liquidy look to it. It actually looks like it's going on more like a paint than anything right now, like a paint pen almost. So if we get kind of a zoom on that painted over shunt, you can kind of look at the other ones around for comparison. There's no pool of liquid metal here. Obviously, you're going to want to watch multiple sources if you're really doing this uh, rather than just take it only from me. But I think you'll be able to get an idea of, of what it looks like from a first time perspective while also hopefully understanding why we're doing it. So that should be OK at this point. You can still see the five milliohm text on it for the most part. So it's not too thick of a layer. If it doesn't work, I'll put more on there. And at this point, what you need to know is what happens next. So next, we're going to clamp the 12 volt on each. So we've got six cables to clamp. And they're going to be the lines closest to the back of the card, where the backlight would be. So that would be this bottom row down here is what we are clamping. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And then this is a sense pen. We don't want it. So we're clamping these six connectors. And uh, that will tell us power consumption. The next part is to run a test that has a known power consumption for us. We can use Time Spy or Fire Strike. And then we compare those numbers to the numbers with the shunt mod not applied with the card stock. And if, in fact, we are seeing uh, higher current going into the card through PCIe, that means that it worked because uh, that's all of that happens before it ever hits the PCB. So the shunts aren't doing anything yet, and we're measuring only input current. What's happening over here is the GPU is being tricked into thinking that it has, it's actually able to pull that extra current through the headers because it thinks that it's running at a lower wattage than it is, which is again just a P equals VI calculation. So that's what we're testing. Okay, excuse the set layout change. It's been a few days. We did some more testing on it. So for the card, we ended up making a few changes from what was done in the first half of this video. The main ones are that uh, the third mystery shunt, which Buildzoid had initially said, until we can figure out what it does, leave it alone. We ended up shorting that one anyway. We needed to. So the first round of shorted shunt testing done with the modded version that you saw leading up to this point did not really work. It didn't do anything bad, but we weren't, when we tested the frequency and the current, it wasn't any different at all, really, than a reference card. We're talking tenths of an amp difference within error, well within error. So it didn't work. So the next step was to apply some liquid metal to the third shunt and did a quick uh, multimeter check of that one, too, checking the resistance, and found that it aligned to both 8 pins, the empty 8 pin and the wired existing 8 pin that's on the card. So the third shunt goes, it, two shunts go to that 8 pin connector. So we shorted that one as well and started to see a bit of a difference. It was maybe one to two amps, getting to be enough of a current difference where you're 10, 20 watts more than you used to be pulling through the cables. That's still not a lot. It doesn't really change anything. The frequency looks about the same. So. After some consultation with Buildzoid and others, we found that the amount of liquid metal you apply to the shunt directly impacts how much you are bypassing that 5 milliohm resistance per shunt resistor. So th the reason for that is, uh, well, there's, so there's two things to consider. One is the more liquid metal you apply, you start encountering two issues. One is that it can drip and cause damage or short things on the card. The other concern is that it can start eating through the solder around the edges of the shunt resistor if there's a lot of it that's kind of dripping over the edges of the shunt or uh, just you leave it there for long enough that it'll start eating through what's, what's on there for the solder for the tin. So that's a concern. We apply just a little bit more, what we'll call a medium amount of liquid metal. It's basically, it's not quite a pool of liquid metal, but it's, a, it's another layer to the surface. That started showing real impact and then we did a bit more than that, what we called heavy, but it still wasn't a pool of liquid metal. And that allowed us to go from something like 18 amps to at the high 32 amps. So big difference there, a major difference, nearly double, getting towards it. 
Uh, so it worked. We finally were able to get the shunt mod to work. We're going to go through the data now on some very quick fire strike scores using our game bench. This is different from our X299 bench that we used for the, the top 10 record attempt. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, but we're starting with the game bench to establish a baseline of what kind of frequency difference we saw and what kind of current difference slash power consumption difference we saw. Let's start with some fire strike scoring just to establish the gains we're seeing and we'll move on to frequency and power next. With Fire Strike Ultra, our first shunt mod attempt had us scoring roughly the same as our normal hybrid card without the shunt mod. The differences were within variance and error, so non-existent. And again, after consulting Buildzoid and several Dare Bauer videos on this, we decided to short the third shunt, which got roughly the same results initially, but after we added more liquid metal, we finally started seeing change. With a medium application of liquid metal, a bit more than what we showed in the earlier half of this video, but not yet a giant pool of it, we were able to achieve a constant score uplift of about 0.7%. It's not much, but it was consistent, repeatable, and it was enough to show that we were onto something. Adding more liquid metal helped. We boosted up to 95.18 points, equating a 3 FPS gain if you were to convert it over the non-shorted shunts, and the result is a boost of about 2.7%. That's enough to start budging our scores higher for Fire Strike competitive overclocking or testing or hardware bot scores, things like that. If you're shooting for higher ranks in overclocking, it's worth considering. It's not really worth much for actual gaming, but that's just something you can see in our Sniper Elite scores, which we'll throw on the screen now. As you can see with something like Sniper Elite, an actual video game that even leverages the extra clock stability more than most games would, the gains still aren't gigantic. It's Something, it's enough to prove that it works, but not really enough to do as a normal gaming upgrade. You'd really want this for more competitive workloads. We saw less scaling with Fire Strike Extreme. Expectedly, it starts becoming a CPU bench at that point, but we'll look to our X299 bench momentarily for bigger gains. What's more interesting is that the shunt mod provided enough power to our GPU to complete the Time Spy benchmark. Previously, without the shunts shorted, we had issues with Time Spy crashing under this plus 200 megahertz offset overclock for the core and the HBM. We could not complete the benchmark without reducing our clock offset or increasing liquid metal on the shunt resistors. And here's why we're seeing those gains. This chart is a frequency versus time chart. You'll notice that most tests, like the benchmarks without shunt shorting, have some fluctuation and dithering between clock frequencies. Although we can hit peaks of 2000 to 2032 MHz, the clock won't hold those, and we'll spend a lot of time ramping up and down based on boost parameters. We've mostly solved for thermals and are operating at a steady state temperature at this point, so our limiter is power. The heavily shorted shunts show a nearly flatlined frequency, which is exactly what you want. Notice that the frequency isn't any higher than the previous peaks, but is holding completely steady at nearly a perfect 2017 MHz. This steadiness, similar to what existed during Boost 2.0 era, is what contributes to our boosted scores. The clock is holding, rather than bouncing between 2032 and 1900, and so we get higher scores as a result out of Fire Strike. And here's a look at wattage down the PCIe cables. As a reminder, power is equal to current times voltage, so we're pushing up to 33 amps in some situations, where we previously were stuck to about 18 to 19 amps. With a 12.3 volt rail that puts us at 406 watts peak down the PCIe cables versus the previous maximum of about 234 watts. That is a massive difference and is starting to exit what, well, is way out of range for what the card was designed for, but it can handle it as long as you have cooling on the VRMs. This does not account for PCIe slot power, so there's a bit more power being drawn there, but we didn't short that shunt, so it remains baseline from before the shunt mod. And for anyone worried about the VRM temperatures, we had that covered. As in our live stream of taking the top 10 slot, one of them, we had a 120 millimeter Corsair Maglev fan blasting the left half of the VRM, a Be Quiet fan blasting from the top, and a Noctua fan from the right side and the back of the PCB, where we were able to cool the right half of the VRM plus the controller. Not only were the FETs operating within range, they were operating cooler than the stock card was because of direct airflow. It matters more than just a heatsink. And finally, here's a couple graphic scores from the X299 bench with one of our Fire Strike runs. We've improved a bit here as well. It would help bump us higher on the hardware bot score charts if we want to play around with those again in the future, at least for now until the other overclockers get their hands on the Titan Vs. 
and gives us an idea of how the improvements scale across a different platform. So that's it for this one. It's pretty cool. The thing here to take away is that this would work on any Pascal card. So this applies to a 1080 Ti just as much as it does to a 1060 to a Titan V. Same idea. The difference, of course, is when is it worth it? And uh, probably not very often for most of you. The, the risks can potentially outweigh pretty heavily the gains. You're looking at, uh, you can get better gains than we did, I think, from what I've heard from Der Bauer and from Buildzoid. There's potential for better gains. But this is not a mod that increases your overclock offset in any meaningful way, for the most part. It's a mod that stabilizes the clock so that it does not choke on the power consumption. So you're running the same high clocks, it's just it flatlines instead of jumping around. That's what improves your performance. So it doesn't give you a ton of headroom by nature of the mod, but it gives you enough that if you're competing for overclock scores or something like that, it would be worth doing. I wouldn't recommend this for a 24-7 gaming machine. Certainly people do it. Der Bauer himself has talked about having 1080s set up for half a year at a time, at least, uh, with the liquid metal shunt mod, but he's not like every user. So uh, generally speaking, I don't know that I could in good faith recommend the mod just because it's, if, if you're not experienced with liquid metal, which we've got experience from all the D-lids, uh, it's easy to screw up. And depending on the orientation of the card, if you do a vertical GPU mount, for example, you're fighting gravity now. Uh, so depending on how strong your, your fans are, if you move the system around, if it gets bumped uh, or just time, it's possible that you could have some drip that would short other components. It's also possible that you could apply too much or too little and either it does, uh, it damages the card, it does nothing, it might just short it and stop it from booting at which point you clean it off and you're fine. There's a lot of different things here. And uh, the point isn't to scare you away from doing it. It's just to say that, you know, make sure you understand why you want to do the mod and then be careful. And you should be fine if you're careful about it. Don't rush it and be patient with the application and all that stuff. Make sure you test thoroughly uh, and it should be fine. It's just, I don't know that it's worth it for gaming, but it's worth it to get higher scores if that's what you're going for. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. So that's all for this one. As always, if you want to help us out directly, you can pick up the mod mat that we used in the first half of the video. This one on store.gamersnexus.net slash mod mat. It's up for pre-order now, or you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab a shirt like this one or one of our other products. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.